Talking Ducks here at the Voice of College Football. We're happy to be joined by Spencer McLaughlin. You can catch him on Locked On Ducks and also Locked On Pac-12. I think when it comes to Pac-12 football and Oregon in particular, Spencer's all over it. Spencer, how are you doing today? Uh, fantastic. There is not a single day of college football news that goes by that is deemed uninteresting in my book. <laughs> That's a great way to put it because it either drives you crazy or... Or you just can't get enough, but you can't call it uninteresting. I would agree with that for sure. Yes. Yes, and certainly yes, Dan indeed. Lanning and his bunch there at Oregon are contributing much to the, the news cycle for college football fans. A lot of comings and goings. A nice little season at 10-3 and three for his first uh, go around in Eugene. But you mentioned to me as we uh, before we started to record Tysheem Johnson out of Ole Miss, the latest edition, 78 tackles, four tackles for loss, turned in a nice season for an eight and five Rebels team. But Dan Lanning certainly knows what he wants on his football team, and he's out there going after it. Yeah, I don't think there are a lot of programs in in the country, Mark, or as Oregon is now referred to, thanks to Lanning, a program. Uh, cause that's how he pronounces the word program. So it's, it's a program in, in Eugene at this point in time that, that would be undergoing the borderline, I don't want to say catastrophic, but gargantuan level of change after what most would consider a successful season. I think that speaks to a couple of things. Number one, the, the standard that has been set for, for the Ducks football program over the last 10 years or so, starting with Chip Kelly and Mike Bellotti before that. And, you know, their, their ascension kind of onto the national stage. I think it's pretty clear that Oregon fans are, are always wanting a little bit more. There's that one title uh, in particular that, that they're chasing. And I think we all know what, what that is. And I, I think it's encouraging to see Dan Lanning in line with that vision because, most programs after a 10 win season would be saying, Hey, this is good. Let's add a couple pieces. Let's do that. Dan Lanning is borderline overhauling the roster. I mean, particularly on the defensive side of the ball, you've had a couple departures to the NFL in Noah Sewell and Christian Gonzalez. You've lost other notable players like Justin Flo to the transfer portal uh, amongst others. And it, it's just been a litany of, of transfers and new prep recruits. And it, it's just Tysheem Johnson is the latest example of that, where you just had two players who have been regular contributors slash starters for the last couple of seasons for the ducks at safety and Jamal Hill and Steve Stevens announced that they're going to return. And Dan Lanning, has added two safeties in the transfer portal this offseason. So he he is coming in and trying to set a very high standard. And Oregon fans overall, 20 combined wins in the last two seasons are not particularly satisfied for various reasons with how those years went. And I'm in that camp, by the way. And, and it's encouraging as a Duck fan to see Dan Lanning coming in and saying, look, we had a good season this year, did a lot of good things but we're trying to get to a higher level. We're trying to be better. We're trying to improve and, and get into that, that upper, upper echelon of, of programs in the country. And I, I think that's the clear message that he's sending with all this roster turnover. There's something like 38 new players coming in. The, that's the sort of turnover you see at Arizona State, rebuild. Colorado, rebuild. USC this last offseason, rebuild. But Oregon is not a rebuild. They're trying to elevate themselves, and Lanning is sending a very clear message that he's trying to do that, and he's trying to do it on the defensive side of the ball. Got Spencer McLaughlin here to talk Ducks. You can catch him on Locked On Ducks and also Locked On Pac-12. Uh, Spencer does a great job there. We enjoy having him on here to talk Oregon football in the Pac-12. So you mentioned some of those other programs and obviously a couple of them are in um, the depths of the basements of their respective conferences, but have some hope and have bright new shiny coaches. And then another one, a season removed from that Lincoln Riley and even programs that are in decent shape um, and, and in a better place um, are really being aggressive in terms of talent acquisition. So do you think for Dan Lanning, it's just all about talent, just pure talent acquisition. We just have to get better talent wise, or is he trying to shape this team and this program in a certain way, stylistically in a, regards to scheme and approach? 
I think it's a combination of the two because the other notable addition Oregon has made this offseason, in addition to Will Stein, their new offensive coordinator, which, you know, in this news cycle feels like it was about three or four years ago, but it was really just a few weeks ago. They hired Chris Hampton from Tulane, and Tulane is off of probably their best season in program history, 12 wins, American Conference Champions, Championship a Cotton Bowl championship, a victory over an 11-win USC team, a dramatic comeback. That team's defensive coordinator is now Oregon's co-defensive coordinator and safeties coach. And I think, again, the message that Lanning is sending to fans and his staff and his team is that we were not good enough in certain areas. Yes, it was a 10-3 and season overall, a success and above average, and you can say whatever you want about it, but the defense let them down in critical moments, particularly in the Washington and Oregon State games coming down the stretch with a berth in the Pac-12 championship on the line. And the Ducks would have been in the conference title game if they'd won either of those two contests. But the defense just wasn't able to come up with stops, just was not able to, down the stretch late in games, make enough plays to, to win a game the way they did against Utah sandwiched in between those two. So when you bring in someone who was a successful defensive coordinator from the G5 level and you make them your co-DC, I think you're sending a message to your coaching staff saying, look, your, your job is only as safe as you allow it to be because if you're not going to be able to perform at the standard that we're going to set, then we're going to look at, at other options. And I, I can't imagine that Chris Hampton would take a power five co-defensive coordinator job if at least being involved heavily in the game planning and play calling defensively wasn't part of that position that's speculative on my part but that, that, that's I think a pretty reasonable assumption there and I think Dan Lanning looks at what the defense did last year under Tosh Lupoi who's a tremendous recruiter but the on-field play calling X's and O's situationally left a lot to be desired and so you know the, those sorts of moves just go back to what I was talking about earlier and that's that the, the, the bar has been set, and I think that you know a 9-3 and three regular season and a bowl game victory against a good North Carolina team is, I don't want to say the lowest that Lanning would ever be willing to, to tolerate without drastic changes, but it's certainly on the lower end of what he expects to be able to accomplish. Well, he certainly arrives at Eugene from a place of excellence, of course, at his former stop. They're doing and, pretty well over there, I hear. Shoot. Yeah. I, I think word's getting around that they've done all right. <laughs> and uh, obviously, he's coaching at a place that we don't want to shortchange Oregon's recent history of excellence. And as you mentioned, the I think clearly the school with the most prestigious history and certainly recently that has not won a national championship. And that's the chase. And that's the goal. That's the dream. Uh, Spencer, we, we are spotlighting Taishim Johnson to a certain extent because he's the most recent, but when you look over all the additions, is there anybody in particular or two or three that in particular intrigue you? Yeah, they've added, I think, nine or ten players at this point, and you look at them and say, boy, it kind of seems like at least seven are going to be starters, and all of them will contribute heavily in some fashion to the 2023 team, which is kind of what the transfer portal is for and what the, the best teams in the country have really used it for, or at least the ones that have uh, adjudicated it most effectively to this point. Jordan Birch is the guy who could have the biggest impact for the Ducks. Comes over from South Carolina where he was – solid for two years he was nothing special but coming out of high school there was an expectation he would be special he was their highest rated recruit since Jadavion Clowney all the way back in I think it was 2010 2011 whenever he committed to the Gamecocks and there was a lot of hype around Jordan Birch he was a five-star recruit top 10 player in his class in, in the year 2020 and he was pretty good this year I think he had seven and a half tackles for loss 50 some odd tackles and uh, you know three and a half sacks which by most accounts for a college football player is a solid contributing season but the expectation was higher and Dan Lanning recruited him to Georgia when he was the defensive coordinator there gets him out of the portal and edge is probably the biggest position of need from the Ducks coming off of their their 2022 season and that that's a sort of addition that you're hoping he'll kind of do a Bo Nix, essentially. He showed glimpses of his full potential at an SEC school, 
but now you want him to really maximize it. That's what happened with Bo Nix, a quarterback this year. Hopefully he'll be able to repeat that success in 2023, but Oregon needs that to happen with Jordan Burks. They had a historically bad year rushing the passer, whether you're looking at pressure rate or sack numbers, they just couldn't do it enough. And they asked too much of their secondary, which they've revamped in a number of ways as well. And I, I think that that's a guy who you're looking at as hopefully is the most impactful transfer. But there are a lot of other names in there who are going to be regular players. You lose Dante Thornton to Tennessee, you add Treshawn Holden at the wide receiver position from Alabama. I think that's a guy with really big physical body type. I, I know people don't say this about receivers a lot, but I am interested to see what he can bring in the run game from a blocking perspective people always undervalue wide receivers blocking but no big play has ever been sprung without a good block from a wide receiver that's just the way that it goes because you got so many guys back there in in the secondary and whatnot but Justin Jacobs linebacker from Iowa another guy that I think is probably a day one starter and has a really he's the most intriguing is one word questionable is another because he hasn't played a lot of football but Iowa, which we all know loves their defense, like loves their defense, thought he was going to be a starter coming into this year. He was a four-star recruit coming out of high school. He only played in two games, got knocked out with an injury. Now he's coming to Oregon. But they had a lot of high hopes for him over there. And Oregon has high hopes for him replacing Noah Sewell and Justin Flo and upgrading the linebacker position overall in terms of production this year. But it is a question mark of, okay, well, we know what we think this guy can be, but do we do we know what he what he's actually going to be? Whereas other transfers, you know, okay, it's plug and play. You know what you're going to get from him. You have a reasonable expectation. I, I think Jacobs is kind of the biggest wild card in that sense. Spencer, you also make a great point about the, the blocking portion of it from the wide receiver position, also in the pass game, because this is what we see from these spread offenses all the time, is they want the ball out of the hand of the quarterback and that quick screen pass out to the wide receiver. And fans either love it because it this seems like an easy seven or eight yards, like it's 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 a gimme, or it's like, why do we keep doing this? Because this gets blown up for a one yard loss or a no gain. Well, you know why? If you really watch those plays, it's key because there's usually triplets out there or two wide receivers out there, and one of them is called upon to block. And if he yep. blocks effectively, it's a successful play. If he doesn't, it gets blown up. And, and, and in those screen situations, which you correctly point out are becoming more and more prevalent for basically every offense in, in some form or another, and teams put their own wrinkles on them for sure, but – you generally have offensive linemen who will get out there to lead block. There's rarely been an instance where an offensive lineman, if he's able to get close to a DB, isn't going to make that block. Those plays get blown up. Just like you said, when a wide receiver misses his block on a DB, misses his assignment, or gets bull rushed back into the the, the ball carrier, the guy who's catching the screen pass there. And I, I think that's an element that, that Oregon had some wide receivers who did a good job of, of that in, in 2022. I think they could still be better in, in some areas, but they lost a guy in Chase Coda, who I thought was a really, really solid blocker, veteran player, tough, physical, gritty guy. And I think that's, you know, a part of the offense that you have to be able to to bring with, you know, the, the modern spread schemes. And we'll see what Will St how often Will Stein wants to utilize screen passes, but I imagine it'll be more than a little. Spencer, we talked around the time that the news re was released about USC and UCLA. And of course, panic ensued across the Pac-12. And panic is different based on the expectations of the program and so forth. So true panic in places like Pullman, Washington and Boulder, Colorado, because of the state of the program. With, with Oregon fans, of course, being at the top of the heap, it's more, okay, there's panic, but there's also some level of optimism or hope that we can break free and we can be the next one that's going to, get picked off by the Big Ten, let's say, for example. Now that things have settled down, I'm sure there's still a little level of concern as to, you know, where is the Pac-12 going to be in all of this? But with this 12-team playoff coming soon, and as long as the Pac-12 remains um, and keeps its uh, Power 5 status, then there's going to be automatic entry uh, a, a, for the champion into the college football playoff. You know, you receive feedback from Oregon fans and then have your own thoughts about the situation. You know, where do you see all this headed and, and how confident do you feel in Oregon 
retaining its status considering there's a depleted Pac-12? Well, I'll open myself up for bludgeoning in the comments first by saying I can't stand the 12-team playoff. It drives me absolutely nuts. I am totally, totally uh, against. And if you ever want to talk with me about that, those are my Twitter handles below. <laughs> you can hit me up any anytime, and I'm happy to explain. But I, I think for Oregon, there was more of a concern early because the question we were all asking when USC and UCLA left was, well, wait. Is, is this conference even going to survive? Is it just going to die? Out? Is it? But time has passed. Dust has settled a little bit. And I think the, the Deion Sanders hire at Colorado is pretty notable because if he can make that team that is not exactly last, they're not near the top, but they're far from the bottom in terms of viewership in, in the Pac-12 and program pedigree and respect because of what they were in, in the 90s, right? Every year, you know, you get further away from that. It can be tough to cling to that sort of brand power, but I think it still exists at some level. And if he can make them into a perennial Pac-10, Pac-12, whatever you want to call it, contender, then I don't think the pedigree of the conference actually drops off very much. Now, it's not a given that he will do that. It is a given because we are watching it happen in real time. He's going to be able to acquire high-level talent. He's going to be able to bring in big-time recruits. Translating that to on-field results is different. It is another level. Just ask Texas A&M, for instance. It's not all about talent, but the best teams in the country recruit at a high level consistently. And that's not an accident. So he's got that box checked, but now has to show that he can go toe to toe with his coaches and staff and, you know, go, go up against PAC 12 coaches of which there are a lot of really, really good ones, but I, I'm not concerned at all about the pack losing its, its power five status. There will be, I think the perception will be much worse than the reality because the perception will be, Oh, you're losing a big TV market. You're losing it, which you are. You're losing your biggest TV market. It's a gut punch to the conference, to be sure. However, if you're just looking at it from a football competitiveness standpoint, people would say, well, you're losing, you're losing USC, you're losing UCLA. I mean, those are just huge, huge brands to lose. Well, UCLA has played in two Pac-12 title games. USC has played in, I think, three. They might have played in another one if they hadn't been on probation back in 2011. But USC went down in the dumps in 2021 going four and eight UCLA that year was a solid eight and four but nothing special and there was no consideration of a one loss Pac-12 champion not getting into the college football playoff even under the four-team model so if you keep the automatic bid which which will exist which I just lament uh in in the 12-team playoff format I don't know how you can look at what the ACC was this year and the depth of teams that, that they had compared to what the pack would have been even without USC and UCLA, they would have had four ranked teams by the end of the year. You would have had four 10 win programs by the end of the year who did very well in bowl games, might I add USC and UCLA, not so much. So the, the, the 10 remaining teams right now were Oregon, Oregon state, Utah, Washington that had 10 win campaigns. Well, those teams went three and one in their bowl games. And, and so I, I think you look at, what the conference still has and also what it can be. It will it would be advantageous if a Colorado or a Stanford, I think those are probably the two biggest brands that have been down, that have been dormant for the last several years. Colorado, of course, for much longer. If one of them can elevate into a perennial conference contender, then you're looking, based on where the teams and coaches are, are at right now, at a conference whose perennial contenders are Oregon, your most viewed team in the conference, Utah, two-time defending champs, Washington, we all know what they're capable of. They've been to a college football playoff before, and then Colorado or Stanford. And if you have that supplemented by really solid programs doing a lot of good things like Washington State, Oregon State, and Arizona, and we'll see what Kenny Dillingham can do at ASU, I don't know how you could compare that to what the Big 12 will be once Oklahoma and Texas leave or the ACC, heck, right now, and say, oh, my gosh, they're just miles behind in terms of having a number of good football teams. Like, I, I just don't, I don't see that. So, you know, I understood the early concerns of, well, does Oregon need to get to the Big Ten? Are these teams, is this going to happen? But now I look at them like, I think you add a couple G5 schools who could be solid teams quickly or in a few years and I, I think you're you're certainly weaker than you were before but it's not so depleted that the conference just needs to blow up and it's not a power five and yada 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 yeah the washington bounce back under kaylin DeBoer That's after huge. the jimmy lake 
debacle that yeah. yeah that is extremely important stanford as you mentioned even though uh it seems light years away it's only been a decade since they were a top five to ten team in the country year after year after year and you mentioned arizona state has certainly been a solid eight or nine win program <clears throat> for times during their recent history so good things are possible there as well yeah and, and arizona state is a really interesting team because I think for a long time, they, they've had some really good years. Todd Graham put together, you know, back-to-back 10-win -back seasons. Herm Edwards had them respectable until 2022 at, at the very least. Like, they weren't a disaster. They were just never great. They didn't elevate, which is why Herm Edwards was ultimately let go after that terrible loss to Eastern Michigan. But Arizona State is interesting. If you talk to anyone who's covered the Pac-12 for a long time, and I – can't say I've covered them for a long time. I've watched them for a long time, and you can put me in this camp for a mindset as well. There is no reason that Arizona State shouldn't be able to be one of the best programs in the Pac-12 from a football standpoint. You have talent in your backyard, much more so than than you do in, in Oregon. You have a proximity to California. You're not that far from Texas. You have an awesome place to go to school. I've been to ASU's campus in Tempe. It's really nice. It's huge. And it's, you know, summer basically all year round. There, there's no, It's not like they have some small, tiny stadium that they struggle to fill up. If they're good, those students, those fans will show up. I, I think there's just been an institutional commitment that's been lacking and an inability to make the proper coaching hires that have stopped them from being that. Because when you're talking about, you know, what it takes – to be a successful, consistent, winning college football program, Arizona State checks a lot of the boxes, and they just haven't been – they haven't been able to elevate into that upper tier. I think their last Rose Bowl appearance was 1997, and ASU fans are optimistic that their their hometown kid of, of sorts, Kenny Dillingham, will be able to bring them there. We'll see. He's got a long way to go. But I, I look at that as a program that has been in the top 25 many a times in, in my lifetime as a college football fan – and I see no reason why if they make an institutional commitment and they make the right coaching hire, and we don't know if Kenny Dillingham is that, I don't see why they can't be a team that you know can, can win the Pac-12. They, they have a lot of the ingredients for it. Absolutely. Spencer McLaughlin, catch his work on Locked On Ducks and also Locked On Pac-12. Spencer, we always appreciate the conversation. It's always really good stuff out of you. Well, I appreciate it, Mark. Always happy to come on and, and talk about the, the Ducks and, and my beloved Conference of Champions.